video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. If you want to protect your online data and security, or more importantly, want to be able to bypass country locks on the likes of Netflix and YouTube, and access a wide variety of content and films like this one, stick around until the end of the video to hear all about it. Okay, thanks, bye, love you. Dead Silence is a dreary homage to classical ghost stories that is nowhere near as bad as critics and even its creators, director James Wan and writer Lee Whannell would have you believe. It's delivered with a sombre, petrified look of coldness as the curse of Mary Shaw looms over the gothically inspired town of Ravensfair, making its inhabitants look like distraught walking corpses whose souls are being bled dry as they await their inevitable deaths at the hands of an evil, vengeful spirit. Dead Silence is by no means a forgotten masterpiece, but as it quickly faded into obscurity amongst the flood of horror remakes, torture porn and soulless jump scare knockoffs that plagued the mid 2000s, I would argue that it was simply in the wrong place at just ever so slightly the wrong time. For context, it's very much debatable when the quality of the horror genre started to incline during the noughties, yet I would argue the willingness for studios to engage more thoughtfully with it came with the release of Paranormal Activity in 2009. Since its release, there was a noticeably confident incline in fresh Hollywood studio IP with the likes of Insidious and The Conjuring, which both happened to be directed by James Wan as well, leading to new franchises to be compared with those that came before it, while independent studios like Blumhouse and A24 balanced both mainstream sensibilities and cinephile representation. The thing was, with Paranormal Activity and Jason Blum's intelligent marketing and distribution campaign, very quickly did supernatural fiction explode into monstrous mainstream popularity, especially amongst the younger teen demographic. I think Dead Silence would have fared a whole lot better if it released during this craze, because for many, 2010 onwards felt like a much needed rejuvenation for the horror genre that potentially would have seen films like Dead Silence be treated a whole lot less cynically. Granted, that's not to say its issues would have been resolved. According to Wan, the film was basically treated as an insurance deal to fall back on if his and Wanell's little indie horror flick Saw completely bombed critically and commercially. So, after struggling to force an idea into fruition, it fell victim to studio interference and became just another innocuous supernatural horror flick that you would find in any random bargain bin. To be fair, it did not help that because Saw was such a renowned success, both Wan and Winnell were now under deeper creative pressure to live up to expectations, as the studio more or less saw Dead Silence as a potential new franchise before immediately backtracking after its box office failure. However, if you know my videos by now, you'll know that I'm a sucker for both pretentious and unpretentious self-contained schlock that has a semi-nostalgic quality that's indicative of its inspirations. Sure, broadly speaking, Dead Silence looked and felt like every other film of the era, but at least it understood the principles of the genre to give it a pulp-like quality, whether intentionally or not, that reminded me of a softer, modern alternative to Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow. To me, its biggest issue is just how emotionally stagnant everything feels, where the only sense of character outside of Donnie Wahlberg is Mary Shaw's creepy ass dummies. You can tell the film's interest is purely on the supernatural aspects of the story, as it's the only thing that feels remotely close to being fleshed out, because our lead protagonist Jamie is such a drag as he mopes his way through the film like a ghost that doesn't realise that it's dead. Obviously, there's a valid reason for this, but his lack of personality really starts to show up against Donnie Wahlberg, who channels his inner Matthew Lillard from 13 Ghosts and knows exactly what kind of film he's in, that he spends all his time chewing the scenery as much as he can, while practicing to be the world's best cliché useless detective. You know, I noticed you have very smooth skin. What's your secret? 
Oh. Well, that never works for me. Anyway, the story follows Jamie Ashen as he returns to his childhood home of Raven's Fair after the brutal death of his wife Lisa to investigate a mysterious message left at the crime scene regarding the infamous ventriloquist Mary Shaw, who was lynched by the town following the disappearance of a young child and now her spirit is said to possess the dolls that she created. Upon arriving, Jamie reunites with his estranged father Edward and his younger wife Ella, as Jamie begins uncovering the truth behind Mary Shaw, who after her death requested to be turned into a dummy and buried with her 101 dolls. But where things get even more ridiculous is when we discover Mary's ultimate motive. It turns out the missing boy was actually Jamie's uncle who Mary did in fact murder and turn into a puppet because he basically heckled her at one of her performances and she took it a little too personally. After which Jamie's family cut her tongue out and killed her and thus ever since her spirit has returned to seek vengeance on the Ashen family and those involved by forcing them to scream so that she herself can cut their tongues out. <laughs> I remember, I never said the movie was perfect, there's a lot I equally like and dislike about the film, but alongside the issue of lacking much character, the story's fatal flaw comes from how it presents Mary's motive. There are a lot of relative similarities between Dead Silence and The Woman in Black, although it's unfair to say Dead Silence is derivative considering the setup is such a conventional trope in cursed ghost stories, but the point that makes ghost stories like The Woman in Black or The Legend of Sleepy Hollow so poignant and significant is that they're all built around human tragedy. There is a sympathetic component to the villain, and where I feel Juan and Winnell struggled to convey their narrative, which was butchered by the studio anyway, is that Mary Shaw is not a tragic villain. She's just an arsehole. Usually in these types of stories, you would expect the characters to discover that Mary was wrongfully blamed and it becomes all about clearing her name so that she can finally rest in peace or whatever, but... She did kill the kid, she is objectively the villain, and her reasoning was purely because some kid in the audience decided to call her out for apparently not being good at her job because he saw her lips move. Like, I get her motive if the kid did something incredibly devastating or she was always secretly a child killer and using their parts to make dolls or whatever, but this logic just seems a bit… weak. While I'm certainly not going to debate the ethics of the town's response, they were not exactly unjustified in killing her to a certain degree, although an alternative way to look at it to give it the benefit of the doubt is to assume that the movie is intentionally leading us to believe that Mary was innocent and then gut punching us with the haunting truth after Jamie and Detective Donnie Wahlberg find Michael's corpse in Mary's abandoned theatre. Put it this way, the town accuses her without ever actually finding Michael's body, so it does leave a massive question mark looming over the truth because it's an accusation based on zero evidence. Hell, it's even stretching the truth a bit to say that the entire town was to blame for Mary's death because it was predominantly the Ashen family seeking their own form of justice based on prejudice with the help of some of the locals. Again, it feels like something is missing from the direction of its story. It moves at such a brisk pace that some of the seemingly minor but ultimately important details feel brushed aside to get us to the next scene. There is no real sense of organic progression to the story, it just gives you information at random intervals that are not complex enough to even call it a mystery. However, what I like about it is just how potent the atmosphere is. While the muted colour palette might be a bit much, the heightened use of red adds a nice stylistic choice to the persistent presence of death throughout the film. Yeah, it's cliched, but it fits with its homage angle, especially with the grainy projector transition added to flashbacks to make it feel like a film ripped right out of the 90s. 
I don't think it's necessarily deliberate, but there's an odd sense of charm to how cheap it feels, considering it seems as if the entire budget went into the visual design of Mary Shaw, the dolls, and Donnie Wahlberg's mustache. I mean, holy fucking shit is that menacing smile terrifying. It just oozes macabre, while at the same time there's a playfulness to it that very subtly tries to break out of its shell. Something I really like about Juan and Winnell's next project, Insidious, is that you can tell they really enjoyed the theatrics of ghost stories, and they had the creative freedom to be more fun and nostalgic with it, whereas it seems to be suppressed in Dead Silence's studio mandate dark and dreary aesthetic. The reality was, the studio clearly wanted Juan and Winnell to basically make a supernatural film aesthetically similar to Saw, so you end up with a lot of fast cutting and choppiness that stylistically makes sense in something claustrophobic and oppressive like Saw, but here there clearly needs to be more suspense and breathing room to let the atmosphere settle in, something which Juan certainly kneeled in both Insidious and The Conjuring soon after. If you could not tell the film was made by the Saw creators, then the ending will certainly dispel that, as Dead Silence tries to make up for its lack of a compelling mystery, with a twist ending that's uh, not bad, but definitely forced. Basically, after Jimmy has a sudden epiphany that to stop Mary, they need to destroy all of her dolls because they're vessels for her soul to possess, Detective Donnie Wahlberg is unceremoniously killed off, hashtag Donnie deserves better, and Jimmy races back to his father's house to destroy the final doll. However, upon arrival, it's revealed that his father was dead this entire time, and Ella was controlling him as she was actually Mary Shaw's perfect final missing doll. I don't know how that works, but just go with it for now, and Mary Shaw leaps out and steals Jamie's tongue, thus completing her quest for vengeance. Dead Silence is one of those flawed yet admirable efforts where the scares make up for its shortcomings. Sure, while it would be great to see Juan and Winnell tackle it again with their more seasoned experience and defined creative voices, there's at least something pure within its concept. It's a short, simple, supernatural nugget of creepy, memorable imagery that doesn't waste your time or try to be anything more than what it is. It's not going to blow you away or make you think critically about the world, but I think it definitely deserves a second chance for being earnest in doing what it does best to make up for its lack of polish. It throws aside the things that get in the way of it, plunging right into the heart of its horror, leaving you with the nightmarish image of a genuinely creepy smile on its face. If you enjoyed this video as much as you enjoy having complete freedom from snoopers, hackers, or anyone being able to track your online activity, then ExpressVPN is for you. A virtual private network masks your IP address and encrypts your data while you're online, so you can protect your sensitive information while online shopping, checking your bank account, or accessing websites that seem suspect or dubious. However, for most of you, ExpressVPN is perfect for being able to bypass country locks on Netflix and YouTube. For example, Dead Silence is no longer available on the US Netflix server, but it is available on the UK one, so by downloading the app for your phone, tablet, computer, or whatever device you happen to like using, simply select a country of your choosing, click connect, and now you can enjoy all that Donnie Wahlberg mustache good ExpressVPN is less than $7 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee, so if you decide to check it out and it's not really your thing, don't worry, you'll get a full refund. So why not take back your internet privacy today with ExpressVPN and find out how you can get 3 months free by clicking my link in the description box below. And until next time, stay safe and I'll see you all very soon.